This webinar is about the awards for faculty at tribal colleges and universities program. Today, we will be talking about this program and how to apply. You can also ask questions in the chat at any time. The notice of funding opportunity is posted and the applications can now be submitted. The deadline is April 12th, 2023 and notifications for this program this year will be made in late December 2023 for projects starting as early as January 1st, 2024 or later. A quick introduction, I'm Mary Macklem, a program officer in the NEH Division of Research Programs, and I'm the team lead for the three awards for faculty programs. I'm a musicologist by training, and I've been at NEH for just over 10 years, and I'm joined here by three of my colleagues at NEH, uh, Jacob Lusk, the program analyst for the program, Dan O'Perry, uh, she's an NEH grants management specialist, and Al Nazir, fun to know, also a grants management specialist. And I will just pass the microphone to each of them to say a word of introduction and uh, maybe just a short comment about uh, how, how you work with the Awards for Faculty program. Uh, Jacob? Hi everyone, my name is Jacob Lusk. I have been at NEH for almost four years now and I work with the Awards for Faculty program um, both in terms of applicant support and working with our grant recipients. Um, I will be here today answering questions for you all as you ask them in the chat. Um, if you ask a question that seems particularly relevant to uh, the audience, I will save them for later after Mary is done presenting and we will uh, sort of uh, take turns answering your questions as part of the broadcast. Thanks so much for being here today and uh, look forward to uh, working with all of you. And uh, Al Nazir, would you say a word of hello? Hello, all. My name is Al Nazir Fontenot. I am a grants management specialist with NEH. Uh, I'm also here with colleagues Daniel and Jacob. Uh, we are happy to have you here and answer any of the administrative questions that you may have. Thank you so much. And uh, Daniel? Hi, y'all. Uh, my name is Daniel Perry. I am a grants management specialist. I've been in NEH just over two years. Um, Nas and I will be part of the team that would administrate your awards. We would actually um, be the ones that issue your official award documents. So if you have any questions about the technical side, that would be, we, you would come to us. Yes, thank you so much. Thanks to the three of you for joining me today. And um, and if you have uh, those who are uh, watching the webinar, if you have uh, questions going forward, uh, please reach out to us. I have an email for the program box. Um, you can reach out to us there. Uh, you can also reach out to us individually. Um, but if you reach out to the program box and it's a question that uh, Al Nasir or Daniel are more able to answer, we can uh, forward it to them, um, or you can also find their contact information in the Notice of Funding Opportunity as well. Um, and if your question is more about uh, what's your, your project, uh, is it eligible, um, what kinds of activities could be um, funded in this program, uh, you could start with us, uh, myself and Jacob, and then we will uh, reach out to uh, Daniel and Al Nazir if we uh, think they are more equipped to handle the question. So today, um, here's a little look at the agenda. Uh, we'll start by uh, looking at the program goals and the uh, scope. Um, we'll talk about eligibility, provide some details about the program and also the deadlines this year, show you the review criteria, look at the application materials and uh, take a look at how to submit your application through grants.gov. As I mentioned previously, feel free to type in questions at any time and we will answer them along the way or save them to the end. On this slide, I also have provided a link uh, to the program webpage, which has all of the information we will be talking about today, including the notice of funding opportunity. Those are the guidelines for the program. And I think the slides are hyperlinked, so you should be able to click on those links as we go through if you would like to. Um, first, let's take a look at the goals of the program. Uh, the program seeks to strengthen tribal colleges and universities by encouraging and expanding humanities research opportunities for individual faculty and staff members. The program supports an individual, 
pursuing humanities research in all areas of the humanities, regardless of geographic or chronological focus. And uh, to respond to faculty and staff at TCUs, the program is designed to be flexible in both project types and award periods. And I will say more about these aspects later in the presentation. Let's now look at a little more detail at the scope of the program. Um, as I mentioned, the program welcomes proposals in all areas of the humanities. Uh, however, projects related to indigenous knowledge that sustain and strengthen tribal languages and or cultural traditions are especially encouraged. Common to all the projects uh, coming to this program must be research on humanities topics, uh, languages, literature, history, philosophy, or religion. Um, projects can be designed for a variety of audiences. Uh, it could be for other scholars. It could be for your students. It could be for general audiences. Uh, the public could be for your community or some combination of all of these. So to take a look at the eligibility, who can apply to this program? All full-time, part-time, adjunct, and retired faculty or staff are that who are affiliated with a TCU are eligible. And you can consult the ahec.org link that's on the screen to check for a current list of TCUs. You can find out more about eligibility in section C of the Notice of Funding Opportunity. The program is open to US citizens. So after, after those uh, level of eligibility, beyond that, the program is then open to US citizens and to foreign nationals who've been living in the US for the three years preceding the April 12th, 2023 application deadline. Um, you don't need an advanced degree to apply to this program, not at all. However, uh, you cannot be a current student, whether that would be working on uh, whatever degree you might be working on. If you are enrolled in a degree program, you are not eligible to apply until you are com have completed your student work. Um, I should say, though, if you have satisfied all the requirements for a degree and all you are waiting for, you've done all the documentation, you've done the final uh, thesis, um, you know, you've, everybody has signed off at your university, all you're waiting for is the degree conferral. Uh, you must include a letter from the dean of the conferring school or your department chair attesting to your status as of the application deadline, that April 12th deadline. Um, please note that uh, there's no cost sharing required for this program. Um, the individual applicant applies directly to the program and the funds therefore go directly to the individual faculty or staff member. Um, there are no indirect costs, and we're happy to talk more about that uh, later in the presentation if you have questions. So I wanted to take a little bit of a step back, um, given the goals and scope of the program. I wanted to give you some additional context about how NEH defines the humanities. And our definition at NEH begins with the agency's founding legislation. Um, the NEH and the NEA were created by Congress in 1965. And the humanities fields uh, on this slide come from the National Foundation on the Arts and Humanities Act of 1965. Um, it reads that term humanities includes, but is not limited to, the study of the following, language, both modern and classical, linguistics, literature, history, jurisprudence, philosophy, archeology, span comparative religion, ethics, the history, criticism, and theory of the arts, and those aspects of social sciences, which have humanistic content and employ humanistic methods. And uh, that's just to say that we have quite an expansive definition of the humanities. Um, and if you have a question about whether your project would be considered humanities by NEH, um, please uh, feel free to reach out to uh, any of us um, to, to talk to you about that, um, particularly the uh, program side can talk to you about your project and uh, give you guidance on that question. Um, so now I wanted to give you a little bit more detail about these uh, awards for faculty at TCU's program. What kind of projects would apply? And the Notice of Funding Opportunity lists a number of possible project ideas. Um, so 
For example, you can do humanities research that's related to tribal or institutional priorities uh, or goals or interests. Um, a project could draw on cultural or institutional archival collections. Uh, you could develop materials in support of sustaining or preserving or revitalizing or all of the above culture or language. Um, you could do research that would improve an existing undergraduate or a graduate course. Um, or you could travel and go to an archive that holds uh, cultural collections with significant holdings in your area of expertise or in an area of tribal or institutional priority of interest. Still some more types that uh, we just try to give you some ideas. Um, so there you could develop a humanities seminar. This could be a new offering for students at the affiliated institution or members of your uh, local community. Uh, you could also develop books or uh, an article, digital materials, translations, critical editions, and other humanities resources. So I hope this list demonstrates that projects can draw on institutional or community archival collections. It could also develop primary source materials for curriculum, such as oral histories, as part of a course revision project or as part of a humanities uh, seminar. Uh, for example, a faculty or staff member might use the unique archives of a university for a university goal or interest. Um, a staff member might collect oral histories to develop scholarly tools or to contribute to an undergraduate course revision. And I should just say it might be possible that your project has a couple different of these project ideas in there. Um, this list is not meant to be exhaustive. So if you have an idea for a project and you're not sure if it would be eligible for this program, um, please do give myself or Jacob a call. Um, you, we have uh, easy to talk to us on the phone or we can also do email if you prefer that. And we would be happy to talk with you about your project idea um, to uh, talk it over and, and, and figure, figure this out. Um, as a summation of the typical activities that are supported through awards in this program, um, typical activities you can see it's humanities research, travel to archives, editing, writing, revision, collection and interpretation of oral histories, ethnography uh, or archival material, and research in community archives and collections. All of those would be things that we regularly see people applying for support for. Um, in terms of what, what results from the NEH support through this program, uh, here's a list of the kinds of things that we typically would see, um, an undergraduate or graduate course revision, uh, a new humanities seminar for students uh, or the local community, um, research products centered on community or institutional goals. So it could be if you have a, an exhibit in the cultural center um, and you work on the text for, for a publication about the exhibit, um, something like that could be uh, supported. Uh, materials in support of sustaining, revitalizing, or preserving language, um, articles, books, and databases. So just to give you a broader idea. Here are some sample projects. Um, these are three projects that were awarded awards for faculty at tribal colleges and universities funds in recent years. Um, Christina Mee at Diné College uh, has been awarded uh, $60,000 over 12 months for her project. Uh, her project has research and writing a book, and she is also developing uh, two undergraduate courses on the practice of butchering in Diné history and culture. The second project was submitted by Elaine Fleming at Leech Lake Tribal College in Minnesota. Uh, she worked full time over 12 months and was awarded $60,000. She worked on researching and collecting historical narratives by Ojibwe women of the Leech Lake Nation. And pictured on this slide is the Tribal College Library where she did some of her archival research and she also collected some oral histories. And the third example uh, is David Overstreet at the College of Menominee Nation in Wisconsin. 
uh, he was awarded $45,000 in support of both part-time and full-time work on his project. He worked on archeological publications about the prehistory of the Menominee Nation of Northern Wisconsin. And pictured on the slide is one of the publications, an article in the journal Wisconsin Archaeologist that resulted from his project. So let's shift into the all important deadlines and dates. If you want to apply, you have a project idea and you're working on this, when do you need to have your materials prepared? Um, the first thing to tell you about this program is that NEH staff uh, read and respond to draft narratives and draft work plans. Um, so if you would like to have some feedback from the staff, these are optional, but we uh, would be very happy to read uh, something for your project and give you some feedback. Um, staff feedback has no bearing on the actual review process, but some applicants, uh, I think many applicants have found it helpful in the past. Um, would you, if you would like to do that, the deadline to do that is February 8th. So that's coming up 2023. Um, and to do that, all you need to do is you can submit it as a Word document or a PDF to facultyawards at neh.gov and just put the heading draft narrative and work plan. Please also use the notice of funding opportunity. It's linked here when you're preparing that um, so that you know the you can try to follow the uh, guidelines as much as possible with that. And then uh, for if you want to go ahead and apply for the program, that deadline this year is April 12th, 2023. Uh, all applications must be submitted through grants.gov, and I'll say more about that in a little bit. Um, you would learn on December 20, in December 2023, probably in the middle to the end of the month, whether or not uh, you uh, were are getting funded or offered an award. And your earliest possible start date could be January 1st of 2024, so just under a year away. Um, but you could wait because you can't rearrange your teaching or you have administrative work, whatever the case. Um, you could wait all the way until September 1st, 2025 to begin the project. So it's a big window um, that you can uh, be aware of. So after uh, looking at some of the, the scope and the goals, some project types, um, when you would need to apply, I wanted to show you the review criteria for the program. And the review criteria for all NEH programs are posted in the notice of funding opportunity for each program. And these are very important because these are what we give to the peer reviewers. Everything is peer reviewed at NEH. Um, there are outside uh, experts uh, and scholars brought in, and uh, there are no standing panels, so it's always a new group of people. Um, they will use these criteria to evaluate your application. So as you are working on your application materials, I would urge you to uh, read the Notice of Funding Opportunity and then pay special attention to whether, you know, make sure that your project narrative and your materials respond to the review criteria. Um, so as you can see, uh, the first criterion pertains to intellectual significance. Um, you should tell your reader what your project is about and why it's important. And you should explain what it will contribute to your specific field or to the audience that you're trying to reach in a way a humanities generalist can understand. And you should situate your project in the broader context of humanities research and knowledge. Describe who will use uh, your publication or your grant product, or if it's a course revision or a humanities seminar, uh, talk a little bit in the, or write a little bit more about that to describe that. The second criterion addresses the quality of the conception, definition, organization, and description of the project and the clarity of expression. And peer reviewers generally find a well-written, clear application um, is uh, a predictor of the quality of the planned uh, work and the planned publication. So writing a good uh, narrative and abstract is important. Um, the third uh, criterion addresses your plan of work for the award period. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, criterion four asks reviewers uh, to consider the applicant's preparation for the project. So if it is a new research area for you, explain how you came to it and your skills for doing this. 
Um, and then be sure to address your language competencies, knowledge of archives, and so on. And then the last criterion that, that peer reviewers will be looking at um, pertains to the likelihood that your project will be completed and also how you plan to get it to the audience that you're trying to reach. So if it's a course revision, um, what form will the, you know, the research underlying it, what form will that take? How will it reach, reach the students? Um, if it goes beyond this one class of students, how might it be used by other courses? That kind of thing um, you can address in responding to that fourth, uh, fifth criterion. So then let's move into what do you need to prepare in order to apply for this program? Um, so you have your project, um, you've uh, worked on the materials um, and you need to know what, what do I need to prepare? Um, you can see that the first three are forms on the grants.gov website uh, that you would need to fill out. Um, that's all being filled out uh, digitally. Um, the remaining materials uh, under the in the, the left-hand column attachments, you can write those offline and you can save them. You need to submit these as PDFs and then uh, uh, you can upload them when you're ready to submit your application package. If you take a look at this um, table, you'll notice the third column lists whether this application item is required or is it recommended or is it conditionally required? Um, so if it's required, you must submit it. Uh, if it's recommended, um, well, I have a, an example to tell you about there with the application. And if it's conditionally required, uh, you should only submit items described in the notice of funding opportunity. And I'll talk more about all of these aspects in the next slides. Um, the other column I want to draw your attention to is page limits. Please be aware that applications that exceed page limits or violet format instructions uh, will be considered non-responsive or incomplete, and they'll be rejected from further consideration. So don't uh, send a narrative that's longer than three pages, for example. It tells you you can have three pages, but no more. If you sent in something that was five pages, unfortunately, it would be uh, not even meet go through review. So um, just pay attention to the details and call us if we, you have questions and we can help. So there's also some links on the page um, for the application package as well as the uh, program resources. I just wanted to talk a little bit about two of the required attachments. So um, just to go back, so you can see you've got the, the required, this one is required, the narrative, the work plan is required, the bibliography is required, the resume is required, um, and this, so it's listed there. So I'm going to talk just about the narrative a little bit uh, because this is really an important piece of the application. Um, it explains your project to reviewers. Your narrative should address four areas which are described in the Notice of Funding Opportunity. Um, the significance and contribution, organization and methods, competencies, skills and access, and final product and dissemination. And you'll notice those pertain quite closely to the criteria that I spoke about uh, in a previous slide. Um, so, uh, so take a look at section D. It describes what the narrative should include um, with an eye to the uh, review criteria. And you might also want to look at application samples on the program resource page to just see what other applicants who have been successful, these are all funded applications, how they decided to go about the task of writing this narrative and, and, and the formatting. Um, these are not models. You don't have to do it those ways. It just is intended to give you an idea. Uh, there are actually four different, uh, four new applications have been added this year. Um, the other required attachment I wanted to just say a little bit more about uh, is the work plan. And this should be submitted as attachment two. It's another required attachment. Um, you can use this to present a schedule for the period of performance. Um, so if you're asking for six months of funding from NEH and you want to work full time, you can explain what you will do in those uh, six months. Um, you should indicate how much time you are requesting. Uh, so 
If you want to work uh, part time or full time or a combination of the two, be sure to be as clear as you can about those details so that the reviewers understand what you're asking for. Um, as I mentioned, the program is meant to be flexible, so there are a lot of project types that could be supported. And the other way this program is flexible is work plans. So yes, part time uh, work is allowable in this program. Uh, NEH defines part time for this program as at least half time. So at least 50% of your usual workload should be devoted to the NEH project. Um, and if you typically teach, say, a, a, a four, uh, four class load and you want to work 50% on the NEH project, then your course load should be reduced to two courses from the four. And if you have questions about that, you can talk to any one of us on the uh, webinar and we'd be happy to talk to you more about that. Um, your work plan, if you change between part time and full time, that's fine, but it must be uh, continuous. You can't do four months one year and then four months in another year um, that's split up by months where you're not working on the project. Uh, two to 12 months of full time work is uh, accommodated or the part time equivalent. So you could theoretically work 24 months half time on a project. Um, So once again, this is that same chart, but it's just with the required, you know, just giving you a little bit less information than that table in the two, two slides or three slides ago. Um, the required uh, materials for this are listed as the narrative, the work plan, talked about those already. Um, the bibliography uh, is a one page document and it should give reviewers a good sense of both primary and secondary sources. Um, your resume is a two page document and uh, the notice of funding opportunity explains to you what you should include on that. And then there's the required grants.gov forms. Um, so the notice of funding opportunity talks about all of those documents uh, with quite a lot of detail and I hope that will be helpful to you. Um, to look at the recommended uh, attachments. So we have one here for this program, confirmation of institutional support. This is a document um, that uh, should show that your uh, your dean or your provost or your college president um, will support you in taking the award, even if it reduces your teaching uh, and service load, um, that you would be allowed to take the NEH award. Uh, NEH now recommends this document be included at the time of application. However, if you can't quite get that letter by the April 12th deadline, uh, you can submit it at any time thereafter and just be aware if you are offered an award, uh, you must submit this before uh, you can uh, proceed with with receiving the award. Um, and then conditionally required attachments. These are documents you should not attach anything extra except the above um, unless you are doing a project like a translation, in which case you're allowed and should submit a sample of your work. Um, if you're doing a visual project with visual materials, you can and should submit a sample of that. So for that, please refer to the Notice of Funding Opportunity for complete details. And again, call us if you have any question at all, um, because we, uh, the NEH is very um, uh, firm about the page limits and the format of application. So uh, we're happy to answer questions and, and, and help with that uh, preceding the deadline. Um, a couple other things that you might not realize until you're applying to the program is that you need to have a couple other things ready to go. So as I mentioned, there's grants.gov forms that are required. Um, and some of those forms require material that you should have ready to go when you're at the, at, at the you know, getting ready to submit. Um, one thing you will be asked for is a thousand character summary of your project and title. And so you might want to write that in advance, just a project abstract. Um, this will appear on the title page that reviewers see. Uh, the other thing to have ready for another grants.gov form is contact information for two letters of reference. Um, and what you need for that is the name of the person, their title, and their one single email to, to reach out to them. Um, uh, referees will be contacted after the application deadline by any H and we will use that email. So just have those things prepared. Um, as some reminders, 
If you noticed in the list above that there is uh, no budget and you shouldn't attach a budget, um, that's not uh, something that is, is required. And you also remember that the funds go directly to the individual faculty or staff member, uh, not to the university. Um, also, indirect costs are not allowable. So I just want to remind you that there's a few um, that you have to be very careful to follow the uh, the detailed instructions in terms of um, you have to submit by the deadline. Um, we NEH does not consider applications submitted after that deadline. Um, also keep in mind that NEH will not consider incomplete, uh, which means you forget an attachment. Well, if it's required, it's incomplete, so then NEH will not uh, move forward with your proposal. Um, if, if it's non-responsive, so your narrative is too long uh, and goes beyond the mandatory page limits, um, or projects that uh, are ineligible for some other reason. Also, NEH will not consider applications that exceed page limits or deviate from the formatting instructions. So uh, I would suggest that you use that application components table and just check your work and check that you're um, within the um, limits for all of that. And section C3 and D2 of the Notice of Funding Opportunity uh, gives more um, about those. So the last uh, few slides are about how do you submit your application? What, so it has to go through grants.gov. Um, that's the first uh, thing to know. And the grants.gov is another government agency. In order to do that, you have to create a login.gov user account. Uh, so you can click on these links and they'll take you there. But also there is a link in the Notice of Funding Opportunity in Section D3. So you can go there um, to use that and to get registered with grants.gov. Um, once you've registered, so you've created your login.gov user, you've registered with grants.gov, now you need to look at your, your profile um, to make sure you're set as an individual applicant uh, because many grants.gov um, people who are applying there are institutions, you know, universities or um, not individual people. Uh, so you have to make sure to set that as an individual or the button that says apply, the red button will not be red and you won't be able to submit your material. Um, Next, uh, you would want to access the application package. Uh, there is a link on the program resource page where you can access that. And be sure as you're doing that to uh, apply to the correct opportunity. So I have a screenshot here. There's three different opportunities. Um, this program is awards for faculty at tribal colleges and universities, but NEH also has a program uh, for Hispanic serving institutions and a program for historically black colleges and universities. So you need to choose the tribal colleges and universities. And then uh, make sure to submit your application early to allow time for technical problems. Um, it, just remember they need to be PDF documents. If you submit a .doc, grants.gov will say it's an illegal format or something and, and you'll have to do it again. So, uh, so if you do this early enough, you'll get those emails and and understand that and you can fix the problem and resubmit. And, and then I would just to make sure you're getting emails from grants.gov saying that your application was received. Um, and if you have any problems in the submission process, uh, the grants.gov agency has a helpline 1-800-518-4726. Um, they're very good and, and can help you with the technical details of putting in your application. And if you if you do it early as well, that's good because you know the phone it, it can get uh, busy on a deadline, and you don't want to be panicked at this you know five minutes before the deadline. Um, my last uh, slide for the uh, this part of the presentation is just some of the resources that I've talked about throughout the presentation, as well as uh, drawing your attention to a few other resources. Um, one is the program website, and in fact, everything I've talked about in the presentation, you can find out about through the program website. Um, most importantly, the notice of funding opportunity or the guidelines for the program, 
It's 24 pages uh, and it, it has a lot of detail, but that's a good thing because the details will take you through this process and what your documents need to include and even how to submit it to grants.gov. Um, we also have sample application narratives, as I mentioned. There's a link for recently funded projects through all three uh, opportunities um, that you can see, get an idea of what other projects have come in and what's been funded. Um, those are projects not just submitted by TCU faculty and staff, but uh, HBCU and HSI faculty and staff. And there's also a brief uh, FAQ document. Um, another way to learn more about the program is to uh, call us. We're really happy to do that. So uh, please, uh, we're really happy to talk to you um, or to email with you, whatever you prefer. Uh, we can read your draft narrative and work plan. Um, that has to come in by February 8th, and it should come to the faculty awards at NEH.gov email box. Um, and uh, lastly, um, in addition to those resources, I have the awards for faculty terms and conditions. Um, if you or your institution have some questions about the award and how it's administered uh, and some other requirements, that's also another resource to look at. So that is my formal presentation, and then we'll shift into uh, any questions that um, we often receive or that we hear from, from you today. Um, these are our names and uh, contact information, and, um, and we'd be happy to hear from any of you and, and talk to you or uh, write with you about your, your project. Um, so with that, I wanted to um, open it up to a more conversational mode and uh, see if Jacob, Jacob's been monitoring uh, questions that, that would come in um, and questions maybe that you've heard Jacob that we could address in today's webinar. Sure, um, I have a uh, healthy group of questions for all of us. So um, the first one is uh, if I apply for uh, the, uh, if I apply to the program this cycle, when will I receive a decision from NEH? Um, and the answer to that question is that you'll hear from us in December um, of 2023. Um, and as Mary said earlier in the presentation, uh, you can begin your award period period if if offered you can begin begin the award period um, as early as January of next year um, or as late as September of 2025. Um, Mary this next question is uh, what is the success rate for this program? That's an excellent question, and um, I would, uh, if I have this question, I, I would direct you to go to the NEH uh, website, and uh, the program resource page will answer this question for you. And I'm just going to go there to look look at it um, right now. So maybe you can come back to me, Jacob, so I can give you that important information. Um, but that's uh, one of the details that we do have on the program. Um, resource page. In fact, here, I'm here now. If you scroll all the way down to the page, uh, through the page, um, near the bottom, you will see that the program statistics, the last five year, last five competitions, uh, the three awards for faculty program received an average of 152 proposals. Uh, the program has a 13.7% uh, funding ratio. Uh, over the last five years, and on average, over those years, we made 21 awards per year. So for any NEH program, you can find out the most up-to-date uh, funding ratio statistics. Thank you. That's that's a great question. Um, Naz and Daniel, uh, the next few questions I'll pose to you. Um, first, uh, well, if you don't mind taking this question, do I apply or does my institution apply for me? Oh, sorry. So the individual applies to this award. The, the funds will go to you, to the individual. Sometimes people do choose to have the funds deposited into their institution accounts because it helps them keep fringe benefits and things like that. But the university cannot take a cut. They cannot take fees and there aren't any indirect costs. So the university cannot um, cannot take a percentage. It all goes to the individual. Um, so just to clarify, they can receive it to their personal bank accounts if yes. they. Yeah, you can choose individual, your own account or your universities. Great. Um, 
Can you speak a bit about how those payments are structured? Um, how can they? Ex how much money can they expect to get at any particular time? The stipends are five thousand dollars a month for full time work, and then it'll be prorated for half time. Um, usually, you get three months. Uh, quarterly payments. So it'll be three months every three months. That can shift a little bit depending on your period of performance and if it's half time or full time. Um, how am I allowed to spend the funds? Do I need to report on how I spent the funds or maintain any budgets during the award period? No, there are no budgets for this um, for this program. So it is basically a salary replacement for the person who gets the award. So you should spend the funds as you as you would your salary. But you won't have to do any financial reporting. Yes, you will be asked to um, submit a final performance report um, reporting on your activities that you undertook during the grant period. Um, but as Daniel said, uh, no financial reporting. Um, all right, so our next question, I'll go back to Mary. Um, are book projects prioritized over articles, course revision projects, or community projects? Oh, that's a good question. Um, right, because there's so many possible projects you could do, uh, humanities research projects, that's a, that's a reasonable question. Um, so no, they are not prioritized. Uh, the uh, Reviewers will evaluate each proposal on its own merits and use the review criteria to evaluate um, the humanities significance and all the, the five areas I uh, talked about. And in fact, um, you know, we look for a wide range of projects, so we're happy to see uh, projects uh, structured in ways that we didn't think of before. Um, we're certainly uh, interested to see that. Um, in, in this program. So the quick answer is uh, no, book projects are not prioritized over other types of projects or vice versa. Uh, the next question is, do projects have to relate to Native American or indigenous studies or otherwise have to relate to topics relating to tribal colleges? Um, the answer to that is no. Um, if you're taking on a community project, then obviously it, it, will probably pertain to the institution that you're at. But if you're proposing um, a book or article project or a course revision, um, it does not have to pertain to any particular subject. It can be any area of the humanities as defined by NEH, which as Mary said earlier, includes everything from philosophy to literature, to history, to archeology. span um, So there is quite a broad net of the, the kind of subject material that, that your project can fall under. And the same for course revisions. It can be for any sort of course in those areas. Um, Mary, another question is, who is selected to be a peer reviewer and do they choose the winners in the program? Oh, that's a great question. So this is more about, so once you put in your proposal, um, what happens, I guess, next at NEH, who will evaluate the proposal and how are awards determined? Um, NEH uses a multi-stage uh, review process and peer reviewers are the core of that review. Uh, peer reviewers are um, brought to NEH uh, or virtually to NEH to read proposals and offer expertise and feedback. Uh, we So they're always a new panel every year. It's a new group of panelists. Um, so we don't have standing panels and uh, the review process I mentioned is multi-stage. So the peer reviewers do the first round of assessment of, of applications, um, but uh, their role is advisory. It then goes to the, uh, the staff and the National Council on the Humanities. Um, the National Council looks at uh, the results and then the chair of the endowment makes the final determinations. Um, and uh, Shelly Lowe is our uh, uh, current chair at NEH, and she is the only one entitled by law to make awards. Um, so you might wonder, why does it take us so long to, 
tell you something about your project. And so you've worked very hard by April, you know, the deadline, I, I know, to put in your materials and put them together and make sure everything's right. Um, and then it will take nine months after that to go through the multi-stage review. So the peer reviewers, um, your proposals are put in panels that are typically multidisciplinary. Um, and experts reading those proposals can read the breadth and offer uh, feedback. And then um, the National Council will meet to look at all the results and then the chair. And so that's why you don't hear until mid-December the result um, of, of who is, is given funding or offered funding. Um, the next question is, um, and I think anyone can answer this. Um, do I have to choose full time or part time, or can I switch between both schedules? Well, you can most certainly uh, choose part time or full time, and you can toggle between the two during the period of performance. Uh, you would just have to make sure you note that in the work plan, or if you decide to change once you've accepted the award and submitted your acceptance form, you would have to um, reach out and submit a revised work plan if that's what you would like to do, and then your payment schedule will be adjusted accordingly. I think a pretty common situation is for people to sometimes work full time during the summers and then you know, down to half time during the uh, academic year, for example. So that's pretty common. Um, and just to clarify, um, half time is the uh, minimum for a part time schedule, but it can be anywhere between 50% and 100%. Um, and as Nas said, uh, your your payments will be prorated accordingly. Um, Mary, who should I ask to write my letters of recommendation? Oh, those are those are great. Uh, all of these are great questions. Um, so for the the recommenders, uh, the referees, I would usually advise uh, choosing someone who knows your work well and knows your work right now, what stage you're at. Not somebody who knew you maybe was more familiar with your work ten years ago, but someone who can offer up to date information and can um, and know the state of the project right now. Uh, also, someone I would share your proposal with your recommenders, whoever those uh, individuals are, so that they can read in advance of their letter. Um, they can read your proposal. They can offer you feedback also, um, and, but also they can write a more informed letter. So in my view, it's more important to have someone who knows you and your work and your competencies and skills much more than it's important to have someone who might be a more prominent uh, name. So um, that would be my my uh, thinking with that. I'd also say if, if you're working in a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary area, uh, sometimes you could choose a referee who is from one field and a referee from another field. Um, I've seen that, that be an effective way so that that person can speak to your, those both those people can speak to your competencies in the areas in which you are proposing to work in the project. Going off that, um, you know, do you, is it all right for people to uh, request letters from uh, a person at their own institution or are letters sometimes stronger if they're from people from other institutions? Or does that matter? I, you know, we often would, would say, uh, it's probably, it, it can be helpful to have referees not from your institution. On the other hand, if you're proposing a project that's a community project or an institutional project, um, and you want to show that there is, is support for that, um, I think that also can be uh, something, you can have someone from, from your institution who can speak to that. Um, so I wouldn't say it's a hard and fast rule. Um, I would try to get one of the referees from a different institution or a different um, realm of expertise, uh, but that's just my my reading of it. That's my my advice. Yeah, I'll just quickly underscore that um, all of this is sort of um, advisory. Um, there um, are 
are no hard rules on who you have to ask to be your letter writers. It could be anybody. And in fact, letters of recommendation are considered optional. So um, if you don't have letters or if they um, aren't able to submit one after all, your, your application will not be disqualified for a missing letter. Um, the next question um, is, what should I include in my work plan? I'll take this and then Mary, if you want to add anything, uh, feel free. Um, so your work plan ideally should um, discuss um, what you expect to have done towards your project by the beginning of the award period, um, what you plan to do during the award period, and then if you're not planning to finish during the award period, what would remain to be done. Um, and of course, because because we're providing funding for the award period, we'd really like for you to break down um, the award period um, in month uh, by month or or maybe by a couple of months. Um, and I think generally speaking, more detail is better. Um, reviewers want to know that uh, the money is is being uh, spent to, work, to to good use. Um, I would say a, a frequent criticism we see is that work plans are either too ambitious or too modest. So uh, whatever amount of time you're asking for, I'd, I'd, I'd encourage you to think about whether the plan of work you're proposing seems feasible for that amount of time um, and to err on the side of, of being more descriptive about what you're planning to do. I think it can be challenging for some people, uh, Mary, when they're planning to say write uh, articles or book projects. Um, it, they can have some trouble saying more than just I'm planning to write chapter three. Um, do you have any any advice for them beyond that? I think your advice is great. I mean, the more details you can provide, it might seem obvious to you that you would visit an archive to to be able to complete the research. Uh, but it, the, the reviewers will want to know, oh, are you going to an archive? Which archive is it? And what would you look at there? And then when are you going to do the writing of chapter three? You know, or do, have you already done the research for chapter three? And so, you know, what what pieces of it remain to be written? Uh, what is the state of the current state of the project? And, and how will the award uh, time specifically be utilized? And then the other thing is you can indicate if you have a dissemination plan. Now, you may or may not have decided exactly, you know, if you're going to publish an article, which venue would you publish it with? Um, of course, you wouldn't know if it would be accepted. It hasn't been written yet. So, but you can still suggest, um, you know, I plan to, uh, you know, submit the article to uh, this publication or that publication by this date. And that helps reviewers also just get a more concrete understanding of how much work you have done already, how the NEH period of performance fits in and when uh, when the project will be finished, even if it's well after the award period, which is fine, um, but to indicate to the reviewers uh, a bit more about all those aspects of the project. Great, um, we're coming up on uh, what I believe should be the end of the, uh, well, the top of the hour. Um, we've just got a couple quick questions left. Uh, the first is, um, are applications accepted after the deadline? Um, as Mary said, no, um, they're not. Um, there's a strict cutoff at the deadline, um, so be sure to apply prior um, to April 12th. Um, and um, then the last question is um, more general. Um, do any of you have any tips for putting together a strong application? Mary, do you want to start? Oh, uh, sure. I, I will start and uh, that, that's fine. Um, I mean, I think the tips are I, I would just pay attention to the details um, and read the notice of funding opportunity in the sense that that document, um, we work very hard to make sure it's clear and covers a lot of details that you need to know in order to uh, get to the review stage. Um, and then once you have attended to those details, the page limits, the required documents and that kind of thing, um, you know, checking details with with proofreading, even that matters because the reviewers uh, will read it. And if there's a lot of work they have to do to understand what you're writing, that can be, um, you know, that can be not a good thing for your your review. So so I would attend to details and allow enough time for that. Um, I would share it share your your proposal, whatever you have, I would share it with uh, 
other colleagues at your institution, uh, even family members can look at it and offer you feedback because if you think about how many people will read your proposal, it's it's not just one and it's not just peer reviewers, it's a whole host of people. So you want, want that larger audience to be able to understand your project and why it's kin. Um, so I guess those would be some pieces of advice, but others here, um, Daniel and, and Al Nazir might have have thoughts as well, or they you might have uh, Jacob, you might have something to add to that too, I know. Yeah, Daniel and Nas, do you do you have anything to add? Well, Mary literally stole everything I was going to say, so I'll just um, you know sort of reiterate the page limits are serious page limits. So if you if you go one word onto the next page, it's so, so sad, but that's the what you're you're going to get cut. You will not be eligible. So just pay attention. And then the other thing I was going to say is have someone else read it, have someone else look at it, have someone compare um, the questions or the prompts and and see if they think that you're answering them. Because a lot of times you, you know, you've written and you know what it's going to say, but it, you should get someone else to to add. Naz, you're muted. Oh, we've been in this for two years and it still happens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but to echo what Daniel and Mary were both saying, uh, yes, the, the NOFO is extremely important. Uh, just follow it. It will be your guide in constructing a strong application. Uh, we've definitely put a lot of work into making that as clear and concise as possible. Um, something I would like to add it doesn't happen often but if you are someone who's a foreign national who's applying for an individual award uh further documentation would be required um that's nothing to worry about uh, just reach out to your grants management specialist they'll tell you all of the documentation that you would need um it and we we will do our best to make sure that your awards are issued in a timely manner Uh, and um, then I would just add, um, uh, as Daniel said, definitely don't go over the page limits, but at the same time, I would encourage you to use as much space as we allow you. Uh, allow you. Um, the, the narrative is three pages. I would encourage you to use all three pages. Um, I, I don't think we, I think we rarely see anyone complain that there wasn't enough, uh, that there was too much detail about <laughs> a proposal. Um, Beyond that, um, I would encourage you to uh, keep looking over and over at the review criteria and make sure you feel like you're hitting on every point like feasibility, uh, clarity of dissemination plans, um, and really pay attention to that first criterion on significance. Um, so many people, um, I think, uh, can underestimate how, how difficult it is to really get across to non-specialists the uh, significance of your project. Um, so uh, really pay attention to that criteria and really argue for a case for for why your your project is important uh, to whatever audience you're trying to reach um, so that that really comes through for us. Um, and that's uh, all the questions that I have, Mary. Um, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, everyone, for tuning into the webinar today. And uh, thank you to my colleagues, Daniel uh, Al Nazir and, and Jacob, for coming today. Um, each of us uh, have different areas of expertise with this program, but we're all happy to, to uh, answer your questions. And if we don't know the answer, we'll reach out to uh, one of the others on the call and our others at the agency. So. Please, um, if you don't remember anything else from today, uh, keep our contact information. Feel free to reach out. Um, we'd be happy to hear from you. So thanks so much, everybody. Um, and uh, uh, that's it for now. We hope to see your applications on April 12th. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.